Okay, so it was about 25 years ago that I announced to my mum and dad that I was going to leave Australia and go to the United States to study something called political science. It's a presumptuous juxtaposition of words, isn't it? The idea that politics could be studied scientifically. And my parents tried the words on a few times with ever more degrees of irony in that way that Australian parents of their age can. <laughs> Until finally my dad says to me, son, you know, if it's a science, it can't be a very precise one now, can it? <laughs> Look, I hear you laughing. I know what he meant. I know what you mean. And it's something I've been struggling with my entire professional life. But I think that view of political science is fading into the background. And the reason is because of this profound change we've been living through this last couple of decades. The data revolution is what I'm talking about. The data revolution is making a scientific study of politics more possible now than it's ever been at any point in human history. And that's just as well, by the way, because at the same time, the data revolution is posing a profound challenge to democracy. Are we going to turn around 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now and realize, oh, the winners of the data revolution have been the big players, big institutions, big government, big business? Or are we going to find ways to make sure that the spoils of the data revolution flow broadly, enhancing democracy rather than diminishing it? And I think that's why political science, the scientific study of politics, is an extremely place to be, interesting place to be right now. To use some language from Richard Nixon, political science now more than ever. Let me talk a little bit about the data revolution. I've been throwing that word around. It might be better if I define it for you. I don't just mean big data, and I don't have to explain to a TED audience what I mean by big data. Data is everywhere. Even the cutest kid in Palo Alto can find it now. It's everywhere. Um, public records, consumer files, spatial data, social and search. But the, what makes it a revolution is not just the amount of data. Sure, we've got great tools for gathering data, publishing data to the web, scraping data from the web. We've got tools for linking data. We're better placed than ever to do statistical analysis, to model data, to learn from data. And data visualization itself has become a beautiful thing. The, some of the world's leading newspapers have to get some of the credit for this. The New York Times and The Guardian have made looking at data something that their readership wants. Part of the revolution here, though, comes from the amount of human capital currently being devoted to the analysis of data. Just three years ago, the term data scientist really didn't exist. And yesterday, I had my first meeting ever with someone called a data journalist. <laughs> the real way this is a revolution, though, lies in an idea. It's an old idea. It's an idea that's been with us for about 500 years now, one of the greatest gifts to come out of the Enlightenment. It means the data revolution that this idea now can be applied to more realms of human activity than ever before, and here's the idea. We can apply that maxim, the idea that grown-up people, when they make an argument in the public space, they have to have reasons for what they believe. They have to have evidence. They have to have data. We may even be on the verge of a second enlightenment because we can apply that idea, that idea, to more realms of human life than ever before, including politics. I'm going to give you now a couple of glimpses from the front lines of the revolution from where I see it in my perch in, in political science. In the 2012 US election, I had a very interesting job with the people at Huffington Post in the United States, doing something that I'd been doing every cycle uh, since the 2000 election I'd been doing this. You scoop up all the vast amounts of publicly available polling, and you try to put it together using statistical modeling to form a moving summary of where the state of play is in each state and at the national level, and you roll that over, over the calendar year. The idea, of course, is to produce a, a forecast as to who's likely to win the election. I'll show you just a snippet of this work. Um, here is, behind me now, each blue dot 
represents a poll at the national level. And you can see in the United States in calendar year 2012, there are lots and lots of polls. The snaking white line is what came out of my statistical model. And the thing I want you to note is not only that there's a lot of polls, but what came out of the model, that at no point did it look like Obama was going to lose that election. For those of us playing the game the right way, in God we trust, all others must bring data. That's what we were seeing. And it wasn't just me, right? It was Nate Silver of the New York Times and a whole bunch of other folks as well. All of us were seeing that because we were using data and statistics to make those pictures. Now, of course, a lot of people didn't want Obama to win re-election. A lot of people called us out as we started producing pictures like that. Partisan bias, statistics are junk, polls are junk. You can say anything you want with statistics. And in fact, I was just at a dinner party and I hear Obama's in trouble in Ohio. In fact, we should be listening to people like that, right? This is, I'm, th I'm reminded now of Peggy Noonan's column in the Wall Street Journal on the morning before the election. Really a remarkable piece of writing, I commend it to you. <laughs> but we, the data revolutionaries, if you will, we had the last laugh. Here's the performance of my model. The last set of predictions we produced plotted against the actual. Every state we thought Obama would win, and I'm just showing you the battleground states now, every state we thought Obama would win, he won. The one state we thought Obama would lose, he lost. And across all 51 states, the 50 states in the District of Columbia, we nailed it. We went 51 for 51. It was a great day. <laughs> it was a triumph of the quants, and we had a lovely victory lap through November and December. <laughs> you might even say uh, here into uh, early May. Um, but we had a ton of help. We had a ton of data, and we had a lot of help from some old friends, <laughs> tried and true in the data revolution. And above all, we had relentless adherence to our principle. There it is one more time. That's what won the day. I want to talk about two other things that are going on in my world, and, and that's the advent of internet polling. This is terrifically exciting. Because internet polling is so much cheaper than other modes of interviewing, it means we can start to interview more people, more bang for the buck, as it were. Sure, there are still some qualms out there about the representativeness of internet polling, and that's legitimate. There's good internet polling and there's bad internet polling, to be sure. But the point is, right now, we're getting at a point where we're able to see so much more. We can crank up the sample sizes to levels that we've never done before. We're, it's the equivalent, if you will, of social science's Hubble telescope. We can see further and farther and with more resolution than we've ever been able to do before. A little bit of statistics. Um, this, that, rather, is a power curve. And what it shows is the amount of data you need to be able to test statistical hypotheses at a given level of, res of, of resolution. For a 3% change in voter support, you can get away with sample sizes in the couple of thousand. But if politics is a game of inches, and it is a game of inches, you're going to need a lot more data to resolve what's going on out there. That's one of the things the data revolution is doing for us as well. We can start to build data sets, 25,000, 50,000, 80,000, 100,000 people orders of magnitude greater than we were doing before. We're starting to see politics in the terms that it's been conducted out there in the real world. Campaigns moving the needle by a few tenths of a percentage point. We're finally at that place as a profession, as a science. One of the really exciting things we can do with this technology is something we call small area estimation. Small area estimation refers to our ability to get really fine-grained estimates of public opinion. What's happening here in Wentworth versus my, what might be happening out in Werriwa, Bradfield over the water there. A, a national poll doesn't let you do that, at least not very well. But when you put the pieces together, as we can do now, big sample sizes, good modeling, great data from the census, you put the elements together, and that's what the data revolution lets us do, we can start to see things at fine-grained uh, levels of spatial resolution. Quickly, here's an example that I just saw the other day before I came out here from, from San Francisco. This is a fabulous study by two graduate students at Berkeley. They got 80,000 people taking surveys on the internet, 
and they asked them about their views by same, about same-sex marriage. They grouped the respondents into state legislative districts. Then they asked the candidates running for office in those state legislative districts what proportion of their constituents did they think supported same-sex marriage. The results are pretty remarkable. Politicians of all stripes underestimated levels of support for same-sex marriage. Conservative politicians did it in particular. Now, this is hot off the press, it hasn't been through peer refereeing yet, but it's just one of many examples of the way we're actually able to produce really relevant pieces of data that, in turn, can play a role in the public conversation, taking some of this work that we're doing in the academy and injecting it into real-world politics. I'm mindful, of course, right, that same-sex marriage is on the agenda here, although I read in the paper this morning Tony Abbott thinks it won't be up for a conscience vote uh, in the next parliament, under the presumption, I think a fairly likely one, that he will be the next Prime Minister of Australia. But nonetheless, you can imagine the role that data like this might play, presenting politicians with perhaps a better read than they might have themselves of what's going on in their districts on an issue like that how powerful an intervention findings like this might be in the public space. Look, it's long been said that knowledge is power. But how about knowledge about power? How about the ability to disseminate knowledge of power, to produce more of it, to push the results out to more and more people? That's what the data revolution does for us. What we've got to find are ways that the tools that I have, the tools that the Obama campaign had, are widely available. Are available, say, to advocates of same-sex marriage or opponents of it, to the Greens up the road in Newtown or the Bob Catter Party or whoever. The, the insights that are possible with the data revolution shouldn't be the preserve of the rich or the powerful. So, geeks of Australia, geeks of the world, What's to be our legacy? When our grandchildren ask us, grandma, grandpa, what did you do during the data revolution? What are we going to tell them? Because this could go badly. Lord knows there are many dystopian futures painted for us in works of science fiction from all on down. So what's to be the legacy? So hack to make money, sure. Hack to do cool stuff. But hack to ensure that democracy doesn't just survive the data revolution, but comes out of the data, the data revolution stronger. That's my obligation as a geek, as a political scientist. And if you're at a TED talk, that's your obligation too. Thank you.